Hey everybody, I'm so glad to be here with you today. We are a third of the way through our nine months long wait until we can be together as church. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. Can you wave your hands in the air if you're excited about that? Yeah! Um, I'm so grateful to Phil and the Sound Booth guys for giving us this way to be together today to sort of um, get to know each other a little bit, to get excited about the time ahead of us. Um, but the, even though the technology is working, thank you to the technology gods for that. It's also a little awkward because I can't actually hear a single thing from your end. Um, so what I need you to do is, every once in a while, um, just wave your hands. Just like give a little wave. You can actually turn around and wave to the sound booth and smile at me um, in the sound booth because I'm coming to you. You see me in front, but I'm seeing you from behind. Yay! Hey, beautifuls. And I need to tell you, you look just as gorgeous from behind as you do from in front. Um, I also feel like because I'm coming to you via this technology, I, I joked at the 9 a.m. service that I feel like Princess Leia, you know, sending a message to the rebel resistance Jedi leaders. I need to say something super important. Actually, now that I see myself, I feel more like the great and powerful Oz, but actually feeling much more like the ordinary human humbug. Um, so I uh, hope you get a good message today. Um, and let's go, let's, let's get a little serious now. The scripture for today is taken from Luke's gospel. It's one that's pretty familiar to us. It's kind of floating around in secular culture. Um, and one of those phrases that, that comes up from time to time, you'll hear the phrase, you cannot serve both God and mammon. I always thought mammon was, you know, some crazy Egyptian god of vengeance, but turns out it's just the Greek word for wealth. But it's interesting how it's come into our vernacular as a rival to God. Um, the scripture for today is just a few verses and it's taken from a, a kind of a weird section of Luke. Luke was a physician and um, he wrote in his spare time, wrote down one of the gospels. And um, being a writer myself, I know a lot of you are writers. You have your books actually in the First Church Library. Um, you, you know that point you reach when you've finished writing your book, but you have to revise it, and there's like three things left that you need to get in there, but you're not sure how to get them in, so you just stick them in the middle and hope nobody notices that it's a hot mess. I feel like this is that part of Luke's gospel. There's just these three teachings on money, and they kind of don't really make sense together, and you just sort of plop them there. So here we go. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Church, will you pray with me? God, thank you for the powers of the internet that bring us together across the miles, that help us to connect, and that connect us to your wider world, to people listening from home, um, homebound, people in other parts of the country where there is not such a place and a people as this community of faith. May we all be held together in the bonds of the Holy Spirit, we thank you for speaking to us, not just across thousands of miles and helping us to communicate with each other, but speaking to us from your distant past through your beautiful ancient scriptures that echo through the ages and that draw us into our future, your future for us. Be in my mouth and in all of our hearing. Amen. So, Church, there are three things that you don't talk about in polite company. One is religion, and you and I covered that last time we were together. The second one is money, at least back in New England where I still live. And Phil broke that taboo for us last week. Thanks, Phil. So I guess that means that next time I preach for you, we'll have to talk about sex. That's something to look forward to. One of the blessings of good church is that we are not actually polite company, that we can talk about anything. And because we can talk about anything, there's no part of our lives that's held back or held out of this sacred space. 
and therefore out of the light of God's wise love. And because it's still stewardship season, let's go back to the money talk and see if there's anything more we can mine from there. So I'm really interested in the discipline of positive psychology. And there are a few things that it's actually taught us about money since they started studying. And one tidbit is that having more than $75,000 a year will not make you significantly happier. I think we have to probably adjust that figure for Bay Area real estate values, but maybe something just over that. Another tidbit is that if you come into a windfall, it will actually make you much happier if you give it away than if you spend it on yourself. And a third nugget that comes to us not from social psychology, but from the Gospels is when Jesus said in Matthew that where your treasure is, that's where you're going to find your heart as well. My friend Martin Copenhaver flipped that and he said, try putting your treasure somewhere like your church, for example, and then let your heart catch up to it. That's worth trying as a holy experiment. So with all this evidence that money and happiness is linked to an upper limit on what we keep and an exercise in generosity that Rachel spoke to us about, why do we still find it so hard to do it? Why do we believe one thing, really believe it, but then do the opposite so much of the time? I think there's a kind of dark energy in money and possessions. It's not that they're bad in and of themselves, but they exert a pull over us that defies reason. You've probably heard it said that we don't own our things, but they own us. And I sometimes think of my things as horcruxes from Harry Potter, the physical objects that Lord Voldemort trapped fragments of his soul in so that he would never actually die. As long as my toaster lives, I will live. Except that my toaster doesn't live. My toaster dies just as I'm trying to get the kids ready for school and out the door on a stressful morning. And then I have to make the decision about whether to buy the convection model with all the bells and whistles for 90 bucks or the workaday model for 27 bucks because I'm moving across the country in six months. And anyhow, then I can give the other $63 to broke folks. Um, I love comfort and ease as much as the next person. And I also appreciate the way things and money can bring comfort to us. But I also hate things. I hate the physical energy it takes to dust them and maintain them and the spiritual energy it takes to defend to myself why I feel like I need this thing when I actually just want it with the crying need of the world in my face. Your brother John Fox just told us in his stewardship testimony that partly because of his relationship with this church and with our God, he is walking away from his life and all of his things to go and join the Peace Corps. And I wonder if, as he told you about there, that there was a part of your own soul that leaped at the thought, that was ready to walk away from every one of your toasters and to follow him following Jesus. Church, you have made a big ask of one another this year. You are asking each other to give between 30 and 50% more than you did last year to this community. This is an amazing leap of faith. It might feel scary like it did to Tim who gave the stewardship testimony last week and who was starting to tithe for the first time. But scared also feels a lot like excited. In the scripture before the one I read to you today, part of that big hot mess, there's a really difficult par parable. I find it one of the most difficult in the Gospels. It's called the parable of the dishonest manager. And the long and short of it is um, a boss tries to fire his employee for squandering his property. And the employee, scared about what's going to happen to him after he loses his job, decides to cheat the boss. And then the boss is so taken with how cleverly the employee gains his advantage that he hires him back. Um, we're not, I'm not sure what we're supposed to take from this. I think what Jesus said afterward, he says with irony, because he asks us in a sense to be like the dishonest manager, but I think he's saying, go ahead, try it, see how that works for you. But then he goes on to say without irony, that if we're dishonest in even a little, we're going to be dishonest in a lot. It's the natural progression of things. And if we're honest with the little things, we're going to be honest with the big things. God can trust us with bigger and bigger things. 
The recovering alcoholics in the crowd know what I'm talking about. Once you decided to get sober, it was like God shined a light into every dark corner of your life. And you knew that if you were gonna stay sober, it would only be by being rigorously honest in every aspect of your life. No more hidden bottles and no more white lies and no more fudged truths about anything at all. And then Jesus adds, actually forget about being faithful in a little or faithful in a lot. Be faithful in everything. God wants every bit of you, he says. He says there's only room for one God in your life and you're going to have to decide who that's going to be. He uses slave imagery, which is repellent. It was appropriate at the time when it was still so much part of the culture. And for us, it's archaic and hurtful. The racial wound left by slavery in our society is still too fresh, but it might help if you think about slave and master less in terms of ownership and more in terms of relationship. Um, it was the whole household. It was the way the household worked together in the first century. God doesn't own us the way we own a toaster. God doesn't want to replace us when we break. God owns us in the sense that God knows we are utterly dependent on her. And she aims to provide for us, to guide us, and she will never, ever let us go, even when we get broken. There's a sense of mutual responsibility and accountability. I want to be owned like that. At least, I want to want it, and I resist it, but my soul, deep down, really does want it. I want to tell you a story about resisting being owned by God and finally giving in to resistance. There's a man in my current congregation, his name is James. For a long time, he worked as an accountant, and he made in the high five figures, not bad for a working class kid from Southie, but he hated every minute of it. He hated his job so much, it made him ill. And yet he couldn't walk away. He had too many things that owned him. And strangely, he was broke all the time. He couldn't figure out where his money was going. Now there's a woman in my church, a double PK, UCC preacher's kid. She had the gift of financial management and knowing how to talk to people about money and faith. And she offered to help James. The first task she set him was to write down where every penny was going, every cup of coffee, every parking ticket for a whole month. And this was how he could evaluate his actual priorities, not his ideals, but the reality of who he was owned by, God or mammon. And then he could be begin to figure out how to make changes that would allow him to really live without fear of money, having it or not having it. But he couldn't do it. He couldn't write down everything he spent his money on. He feared knowing more than not knowing. He feared what the truth would tell him, even if that truth would set him free. So instead, he had a nervous breakdown. He left his job because he had to or he would have hurt someone. He became homeless for a year. He moved to Florida, then to New York City, then back to Boston and to our church. He got on disability. He got a single room occupancy apartment where he still lives. And he learned to live on what he had, which was much, much less. He went to Debtors Anonymous and he went to AA and he's been sober for six years. And now he's back in school and he's getting a degree in social services and he works part time for the Somerville Homeless Coalition because he has a heart, a tenderness for people who are broke. He gives more to his church now than he did when he was back earning in the high five figures, which on a fixed income is kind of a holy squandering. He has a purpose and a path. He is owned by God. This is basically the story that James told us last week during our worship service, during our annual drag gospel festival in his persona as Serenity Jones, our drag queen in residence. And starting next week, when my church starts their stewardship campaign, more people will tell stories like this. They probably won't be as dramatic as James's story, which was literally almost losing his life to find the life Jesus was offering him, but they will be just as honest. 
They'll tell about how they are trading mammon for a real God and trading earthly treasure for the true riches Jesus talks about. And they'll even tell the entire congregation the dollar amount of their giving and what this represents as a percentage of their income. They will probably feel shy and scared when they're doing this because it's so radically countercultural to talk openly about money, how much we have, how much we give away. We feel, even though we know intellectually it's not true and spiritually it's not true, we feel like the amount of money we make is what we are worth as human beings. But Jacques Derrida said we fall silent before our gods and we therefore know our gods by the things we have difficulty talking about. And corporate America thrives on this. It thrives on our silence. It puts mammon first, not just by tying us in emotional knots over the almighty dollar and by keeping that endless cycle of earning and squandering going, but it also depends upon us keeping financial secrets and keeping silent about economic injustice because we might find out just how really bad it is if we start talking about it and that might move us to change the system. Think about your own workplace, maybe, the prohibitions on telling your coworkers what you make because if people began to share this information, they might find out that their company is discriminating based on age or color or gender or any other way that humans have of dividing each other. We're supposed to keep silent about money to protect and preserve the status quo. But when we start talking about it, we blow up the whole system. When we redistribute income ourselves, when we pool our resources like we do in church to do big things in the world, we threaten the whole shebang. We become a force to be reckoned with. And when we reject mammon as our God and receive God as our God, People all around us who don't know that much about Christianity start to take notice because they see us acting like Christians. And they realize that the witness of progressive Christianity is not at odds with the liberal values of the Bay Area, but perfectly in tune with them. And we call our entire culture, sacred and secular, back to its purpose, to share what we have been given for the commonwealth. It's hard to make these changes. I know it's scary to stand naked before God. Here's the thing. God has already seen all of us naked. And if we're wearing any clothes at all before God, they belong to the emperor. But while mammon is fickle, our God can be trusted forever with any information. And if we make a beginning at letting God have access to every part of our lives, if we let God own us as her children, God can finally do all that she's able to do, which is more than we could ever imagine. Amen, church.